Welcome to UOG Today. I'm Paul Peppis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Jill Hartz, Executive Director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. Hartz has organized numerous exhibitions, primarily in the contemporary art field, and is the editor of five books, including Rick Barto, Things We Know But Cannot Explain, co-edited with Daniel Knapp in 2015, and Hindsight, Foresight, Art for the New Millennium from 2003. She is President Emerita of the National Association of Academic Museums and Galleries and a reviewer for professional museum programs, including accreditation. Hartz will retire from the UO in August 2019. Thank you, Jill, for coming on the show. Thank you. I'll actually retire in December. In December, okay. But I'll stop being director when the director gets hired. Okay. Yeah. So you came to the University of Oregon in 2008 to be the executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. What attracted you then to the museum? I think um, a number of things that I think are still among the museum strengths, really. Um, I was coming from the University of Virginia, which is a much smaller museum there, and we were, at the, we were in various campaigns to try and have a new building with all the things that the Schnitzer Museum has already. So I walked in and it's like, oh, we have a loading dock. We have all these galleries. We have an education suite and a lecture room. We have staff. We even have bathrooms. <laughs> so it was like, you know, it's the toss up between you have everything that you wanted, but you don't get to build it yourself. But knowing at that point, well, I could just take this. So that was one of the main things. The other thing was a, um, staff, and there are a few that are still here, including Kurt, that um, made me realize that I could work with these people and that we'd have the same vision and you really need a team, especially with a large museum, of how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I never lived in the West or the Pacific Northwest, so it was kind of an adventure, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of an adventurous person, <laughs> so I liked that mm -hmm. aspect of a whole new territory. And I especially liked being able to, I don't want to say build something from scratch, but they really needed a good director for this museum at the time that I came, mm -hmm. and it was kind of, it gave me an opportunity to, in a way, reinvent myself as well as reinvent the museum. Hmm. So let's talk about that reinvention. So how has the museum grown and evolved during your tenure? When I came, the museum had and still has a really strong school program, K-12 program, with thousands of school kids um, coming to the museum for tours um, that support arts learning, um, curricular initiatives, different things like that. But we were almost, as were most academic museums in the early 2000s and earlier, really not affiliated in many strong ways with their university. They were kind of like alien spaceships that took up space on campus. Mm -hmm. So in 2008, you may remember, was when Brandeis' um, Rose Art Museum happened, which woke up all of us in the academic so museum just field. So viewers what, that, what you're referring to. So um, Brandeis was hit with the Madoff um, Ponzi scheme. So not just their endowment, but a number of their donors had lost significant money, and they were trying to balance their budgets. We can come back to that idea again. But um, they had um, they had an art museum, they still do, the Rose Art Museum, which has fabulous artworks and is mostly a modern contemporary collection, probably worth millions. And the president of Brandeis decided that, well, they could just sell works from the collection in order to balance the university's budget. She didn't go through the museum's advisory board. She didn't ask faculty or students. So when all of this became public, there was this huge outcry. And it was on campus from donors, too, that were willing to pull their money. And in the end, um, the president had to step down. Mm -hmm. But all of us um, in the museum, academic museum world, like shook up and said, oh, so not that we want to blame the Rose Art Museum in any way, but is there a way to try and avoid this? And for me, um, that really meant, how can we be the best academic museum on campus? How can we really model a teaching role that would be the best in the world if we could? How do we make ourselves through this teaching role integral? to the campus so they'll understand why they're spending all this money on museums, because mm -hmm. museums are high-end operations. Mm -hmm. So my 10 years has really been um, focused on integrating us across campus, um, 
you know, um, understanding the brain trust of faculty, the needs of students. How do we um, train our students to become global productive citizens? Um, not just academically, you know, competent, but really able to um, make us all proud and make the world a better place. So that's really a lot of the focus. In addition, we have expanded all of our community education programs. So um, academic museums that serve as their city museums too have this double role. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that we can do this, but we have to do that too. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on both those fronts and building staff and programs that really are responsive to the needs and the goals of both our university and our community. So let's start with the academic side. So tell us about some of these programs that you've initiated that advance the u university's academic mission. Well, I think that um, what we, other than art history and studio and maybe museum studies, programs that have a natural affinity to us, you can assume that faculty know what to do in a museum or how to use our objects to teach with. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did, um, and this was thanks to both the College of Design and Arts and Sciences and the Provost's Office, was to create an academic support grant program where we could incentivize faculty with a little bit of money mm -hmm. to come in and use the museum as a site of learning. And so what we would do is look at the course catalog, look at what research interests faculty have, look at our collections and galleries, what would be out, and um, try and nurture that and say, you know, we have this going on and we think this could be useful to you. Would you consider doing this here or partnering with us on that? So um, what that enabled us to do was to acquire art, bring speakers, um, do publications, really give students hands-on learning opportunities. So it was a win-win and I think that lasted for almost eight years. And through that, an enormous number of faculty and students came so that now, um, as of last year, 9,200 students took classes or class assignments in the museum, which is extraordinary. And when, when you started, was that happening at all? Zero. Okay. Zero. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> impressive. Um, so a, a related um, accomplishment is uh, in 2018, the museum and UO libraries were awarded a Mellon Foundation grant, mm -hmm. which is also contributing to the academic oh, mission. So tell us a little bit about right. that. And I think that goes to the heart of um, understanding that a museum is a research institution. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just faculty that do that, all of us do that. But um, the Mellon Foundation was really interested in bringing museums and libraries together because both of our um, units on campuses have changed so dramatically over the years. Um, and we haven't really grown together in some ways. We've grown in very different ways. Muse um, museums have become object-based learning centers with person-to-person -person contact. Mm -hmm. um, libraries have become digital humanity centers. Mm -hmm. So they have access online. Um, and if we put the two of those things together, imagine what we could do. So. Um, and Mellon could see this, and we didn't really know that until we started talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So Adrian and I started talking to each other and realizing, wow, we knew we shared collections, but what would happen if we invited faculty to come in and say, use our collections and our priorities and do your research and do some public component to that. So we have a number of core collections like Gertrude Bass Warner and um, other Asian objects and photographs, all kinds of things that can be investigated by faculty. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we applied to Mellon for a new joint position, um, a Mellon fac fellow that would help manage this program and then through the university support, we um, received two graduate employees and a grants program to again incentivize faculty to do one year projects. Mm -hmm. So over the course of two years, we'll have six faculty that will have major projects that range from you know, just exploring certain aspects of fine art to mental health in Oregon. I mean, they're really creative programs. Can you tell about one of them? Well, the one that's completed so far is um, um, David um, Frank. Frank's project, which, and David's in the Honors College now. But um, a number of years ago, we, um, we asked for, we received a major collection of work by James Blue. James Blue was a filmmaker who graduated from the university and did a number of documentaries around the world. 
Um, but most of these documentaries were shown um, through the USIA and only available outside of this country at embassies and other places. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that James Blue did was the film that's called The March, which many of us have now seen on PBS, um, which contains the famous speech by Martin Luther King, and it's all about the March on Washington. So David Frank, who's an American historian and especially interested in civil rights and slavery, took that film and created um, how a really deep website on that when did in extraordinary research on it, including um, telephone conversations that Johnson had about whether this film should be shown. Mm. Um, so I encourage anyone to Google the March and our Mellon project and see what we're doing. But that one, I think, has literally had thousands and thousands of hits for that, and we expect that to live on and hope that others of James Blue's films will get similar treatment. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little bit about the public outreach side of what the mm -hmm. museum does. So why is it important for an academic museum to engage the general public? Why is that an important part of what you do? Well, I mean, for some of us, we think that art is critical to being human and in making our world a better place. Mm -hmm. And there are so many reasons why we do that. One, of course, is that there is no other art museum in our region other than Portland. You have to go down to San Francisco for a major art museum if you're going south. But um, the arts, arts education is rarely in our schools these days. So. We are there, symphonies there, other groups are there, because if you don't grow up with the arts, how do you know that you're not going to, you won't miss it? And what we want is to train, you know, culturally aware people, and the arts tell us who we are. They help us understand our identity. And they also, as it turns out, make us academically um, better achievers. So by analyzing art, by making art, you're using other parts of your brain, and you're also connecting to different parts of your well-being. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't just work for K-12 students or adults, but also challenged populations. Because I think one of the things I've learned in the museum world is that we're a flexible institution that can use art to make our world better and our community better for those who need help. I mean, because those of us that appreciate it, we're going to get it wherever we go, mm -hmm. you know. But for others, we can make their world better and their lives, everyday lives better through arts workshops or coming to a museum or having just that moment of looking at a piece on your own and thinking about whatever you want to do. And in that regard, our fastest growing program now is Art Heals. So we're working with the medical community and teaching medical students how to be better doctors. If you asked me 20 years ago if we'd be doing that, it'd be like, are you kidding? But it's like it's so exciting. And we're helping both patients and caregivers, including doctors, nurses, and others, to deal with stress and to better communicate, be more empathetic, and, and appreciate what they do. So let's explain how, how, this, how the program works a little bit. So for Making Better Doctors, there's um, a nationally recognized program called Visual Thinking Strategies that we take people through, our educators do that, and you're looking at a work of art and basically it would be, so what do you think's in there? What do you see when you look at this and you listen to someone like, what makes you think that? What in that work makes you say that that's what's going on? You know, is it a narrative or what else it is? And then you ask other people, do you see that? Or what do you think is going on? And so you're sharing all these different opinions. Um, sometimes you see things you didn't see before, or you don't think that's what's going on, but you have to listen to other people say that. But this is this process of looking and using your brain to try and figure out things and understand how an artist may to work, but also what that artist may have been trying to communicate or even what you see it changes how you approach your life and what you see. It makes you much more visually literate and more analytical. So that when you're looking, say, at an x-ray, mm -hmm. and these are where the tests have been done, which is a little scary, if you um, have someone who hasn't done this look at an x-ray and tell you what's going on, and then have them doing it after they've gone through visual thinking strategies, they actually see more. They can analyze it better. So you kind of want to say to your doctor, do you know visual thinking <laughs> strategies? Can I bring you over to the museum first? <laughs> so t tell us about um, some of the programs you do both uh, in, on campus and to the community that address diversity. 
Um, we've been working very hard on building diversity, access, inclusion, all the things that the university values and museums especially value too. So we have um, a lot of, dif I mean, diversity is, is a rich panoply reflected in our collections, right? Um, and we have growing audiences, especially from Mexico. Um, so we have, we've partnered with Oak Hill School and Armando Morales on Dia de los Muertos, I think which is now maybe going to be in its 11th year. So we have regularly, you know, 2,000 people over even a two-day period that come to celebrate um, family um, cultural rituals that they happen, and then Anglos learn about that too. We have family days that let people um, come and appreciate their cultures and, and express those. Um, and we, um, years ago, we created through the Cultural Trust um, Grant a Latino um, engagement plan. So we reached out to communities across our area through churches, schools, um, Centro uh, Latino Americano, different other groups, to come up with a plan that would respond to their needs. And one of those needs was um, the isolation of young mothers. So we have a Madres group that's been growing I don't know, eight years now? And you know, they'll become our volunteers and docents and they help out in other ways. So we really want the museum to be a second home to so many um, people in our community who maybe haven't grown up with museums or need a safe space um, and want to see themselves where they go. So tell me about the Art of the Athlete or Don't Touch My Hair, some of those programs as well. So those again are other outreach programs. So um, many years ago, I guess Lisa Abia Smith, who's our director of education and is also a faculty member um, in the College of Design, came up with this idea of working with athletics that um, there would be a really we should come up with ways to uh, to kind of have athletics, stu the students in our professional athletic programs really have an opportunity both to de-stress so that they don't have to be you know, the champion on the court or the field, but also um, connect to other areas of the university and learn in other ways. So we have a summer program where they take a course and they explore their own identity and they learn art making techniques. And in that process, some are good artists, some aren't, but they take the process as seriously as they do as being an athlete, which to me was like, wow, this is really cool. But then they also volunteer as part of this um, to support our younger audiences. We have a Kennedy Center program for kids that um, have disabilities. And they come and they make art with them. So a kid with autism is looking at the, you know, a football star, and they know who they are. And it's like, wow, you're making art with me. <laughs> but I think giving back um, is something we all appreciate. We know that as much as you know, we, we receive gifts from others, giving to others makes us feel even better. And I think that's what's happened with the athletes, and now it's expanded even to a, um, an overseas program in the summer. But um, we have, and some of these athletes come back and they get the graduate programs after they've decided that maybe professional sports isn't the career that's going to take them you know, forever, mm -hmm. um, or they have other interests that will use their mind and skills better. Um, so t tell about uh, Don't Touch My Hair. And Don't Touch My Hair, um, so that was yesterday, last year's show, which was a student organized exhibition by graduate students. Um, and, it's, and it was done by students, cur curated by students, photographed by students, and involved a series of conversations with students about identity issues on campus, especially for students of color, and how do they represent themselves, and what is their experience at the university. So we had a wonderful show of photographs, which they posed for, that really expressed who they are through their hair and they would write text about that. And Guy, the photographers were students. Were students as well. And then this year we have common threads and it's very similar, but it's how do students express themselves through what they wear? What do they um, convey to the world and who are they really and you know, and how do they show that? that and also student photographers All for that. students. And um, so our corridor education galleries, which are on our main level, feature um, regularly exhibitions organized by students and um, responding to artwork created by members of our community. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned the common thread, so let's talk about the co your, how the museum has enhanced the university's common reading program. That's one of the most exciting things. And I think that we didn't really understand that the university had a common reading program. It came through the Honors College. But when um, we knew that Ta-Nehisi Coates was coming and it was between the world and me and 
we had kind of a small gap in one of our galleries. It was like, we should get on board this. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, and this connects to our Masterworks on Loan program where we have California collectors that loan works of art to us, we were able to go back to um, the Marcianos who we work with who have just set up a museum in LA. And I knew that they had major works by African American artists and asked, can you help me with this? And they got on board with um, you know, our teaching mission and lent us works by Theaster Gates and Glenn Brown, um, not Glenn Brown, but Glenn Ligon and many, many other artists that matched works in our own collection. And we were really able to explore what we were doing. What we found was that show was the most used exhibition we have ever done in terms of curricular support. Mm -hmm. So from then on, it's like, oh, okay. So, you know, whether it was, um, you know, each year allows us to explore identity and culture in a different way. And so this coming year, under the feet of Jesus, we're looking forward to looking at the lives of migrant workers in California and migration to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so tell us about how you've broadened the scope of exhibits at the at the museum. So what 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 are we s able to see in the museum now that, uh, that we didn't see before? Yeah. Well, and I have to say this is also because of an incredibly great team of curators, educators, collections managers. You know communications, everything that we do depends on making this happen because we have a relatively big museum. Um, until we had a full-time curator of Asian art, we didn't change our Asian galleries, which are almost half our space. So now those change once a year at least, and we've brought them up to the present. So as Ann Rose Kitagawa, our chief curator, likes to say, it looked like everyone died like around 1900 in Asia. But now we actually have them living even today. <laughs> so it's really great to see this dialogue between tradition and contemporary thought. Um, we've also, again, you know, reaching out to our um, Latino communities and in response to both um, the Latin American studies faculty and programs and Asian studies faculties, we've worked closely to figure out what kind of acquisitions, collections, gallery exhibitions we should have that will support um, what they're doing as well as community interests. So we have a growing Latin American collection and my own interest is contemporary Cuba. So I have to say we have one of the finest Cuba collections in the country. Um, but I think that what we're trying to do is, um, what I keep in mind is for the perfect undergraduate that would come to see everything we do over a four year period, <laughs> you know, if they came through and saw the range of media, the range of cultures, the kind of subject matters we do, they would have a really great understanding of why art is critical to understanding our world in the past and today, and how they think about um, their own place in it. Mm. So how do you envision the museum's future? I mean, when you think about what's gonna be the JSMA in 10 years, what do you think about? Um, I think that we're on a great course in terms of how we're looking at building community and being responsive to both the university needs as well as the larger needs in our community. I think we have practices in place that can do that. I think our issues are primarily funding because mm -hmm. museums are expensive. We're an accredited museum and you can't cut corners. So then the question is, you know, we understand budget cuts. You know, do you have to cut back or do you become on, more entrepreneurial? We're always fundraising. We're doing, you know, I don't think we leave any rock unturned, you know? But I think we have to start looking at new ways of doing things and how we can find new avenues for revenue that may take us in totally new directions but still core to our mission. And that, I think, is, the, is to me, a really exciting challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're kind of a canary in the mine in turn of higher education and, and academic museums. So maybe what we can try and figure out is something we can share with other museums so they'll survive and flourish too. So um, how can community members become involved with the JSMA? In so many ways. There's membership, everything's online, JSMA, just look us up. Um, they can be volunteers. We have a really active docent program. We have um, volunteers, receptionists as well. Um, but there's so many co um, committees that we have that help um, advise me and my staff. And those aren't just our leadership council members, but anyone that could be interested in doing that. And different levels of membership do different kinds of ben benefits, depending um, on what people are interested in. But um, 
programs. You know, check out our programs. We try and leave calendars all around town. If you're a member, you get our um, members magazine, which kind of entices you even more to come. Um, Wednesdays, we're open till 8, so if you're working all day and wondering what to do, come in the evening. Um, we're open on weekends as well. So um, I think there's something for everyone, and what we find is once you come to the museum, especially if you haven't, it's like, oh my gosh, what a great thing to have in our community. So uh, what are your plans for retirement? So, you know, you, you're retiring. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but uh, tell us what your plans are. Well, as you know, my husband lives in Ashland. He runs the Ashland Film Festival. So after a few years, it would be kind of nice to live together. Um, I have cu um, curatorial projects coming up, including a couple exhibitions in the next two years. And Ann Rose and I are starting to work on another major show. So I don't think I'll be a stranger to the museum, but I'll work in more curatorial ways. Um, I'm on the National Accreditation Commission, so I'll still be working on professional practices, which I'm really dedicated to. And depending on what happens here in terms of entrepreneurial adventures, maybe I'll be involved in that. But I'd really like to take time to write. I'd like to get back to yoga and meditation. I used to be a really serious Zen student. So maybe part of me remembers like how to do that. And <laughs> you know, I think we have to prepare for the next stage in some ways and be as aware as we can. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think I'm really lucky, I hope, to be able to have that time. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. So um, last question, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment at the JSMA? Boy, I mean, I think it's, I, I, first, first thing that comes to me is building a staff mm -hmm. that will carry this on, mm -hmm. building a sustainable structure that isn't dependent on me, mm -hmm. because I think that as we get older, we realize it takes so much work to manage nonprofits and keep them going that you don't want them to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So being able to create this, you know, some people call it a jewel. It's, it's like you polish and polish and polish to make this jewel, but um, that it's going to keep going mm -hmm. and that it's so vital and people really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It gives me a lot of satisfaction. Well, good. I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm among many who feel that way about it, and I want to thank you for everything you've done for the JSMA and for the University of Oregon and for the city of Eugene in the 11 years you've been doing this job. It's been a great joy. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much, you. Jill, for talking to us today. It's been a real pleasure. I've been speaking with Jill Hartz, Executive Director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. She has served in this capacity since 2008 and will retire from the directorship in August 2019. Thanks so much for watching.